We are live. Good morning, good people. Happy Friday. Um, to start off, I'm really excited today because we are going to have a conversation and a, um, you know, we're going to try out a little cooking class with a friend of mine, someone I very much respect, Julian Napoleon, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself. But I'm excited to talk all things Indigenous food freedom this morning to continue this conversation we've been having this week. Um, before we get right into it, I want to take a moment and just say congratulations to the Tethcoatine Nation um, for a decision that came from the Supreme Court of Canada yesterday. Breaking news for the nation, the Supreme Court of De uh, Canada decided not to hear a request for leave for appeal from the big, massive mining company Tosico Mines, who's been trying to build a $1.5 billion open pit copper and gold mine in Tethcoatin territories for the last 30 years. So this has been a 30 year, that's, old, I, that's older than I am. Imagine a fight against a mining company to protect a sacred lake, salmon spawning grounds, rites of passage grounds, you know, just a sacred part in their territory for over 30 years. So we just wanna say congratulations to the Tethcoatin people. Um, this is big news, it's a big victory. There's no way for this new prosperity mine to be built now. If the company wants to start from scratch and propose an entirely new project, um, that's unknown, that's up to them, that's a very expensive ordeal. So those are conversations maybe they're having with their investors at this point, I'm not sure. But the focus is to just say, you know, this is a win for the Tethco team people. I've been to those territories, I've reported on the story before on this battle, which the Tethco team leadership assured me is just as much of a spiritual war as it is an actual legal war. So, you know, I'm just, my thoughts and my my heart is with all of you and I'm very grateful for this good news during these times. So moving on from there, I would like to bring Julian Napoleon into the conversation. Dante. Hi. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Dante. Julian, to start off, can you introduce yourself for folks? And every now and then I'm going to take myself off the screen so we can just get the full coverage of this yeah. beautiful scene you have. So please okay. introduce yourself for us. So I'm Julian Napoleon, and uh, I'm Danisa and Cree and Ukrainian, and I live up here on my reserve, south of First Nations, it's up in in the Northeast in Treaty Eight territory, right on the shores of so-called Moberly Lake. <laughs> Got the uh, idea of renaming it or bringing back the old name to this place, you know, something that's really needed, but it's currently called Moberly Lake and. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful place. I work here right now uh, with our, our Clean Seas of Caribou herd as a caribou guardian, and we have a maternity pen. So right now it's it's calving season up there. I'll be heading back up on Monday and uh, be with those mothers as, as they go through that sacred process of, of birthing all the beautiful calves. So looking forward to that. Um, I also do other kind of sciencey stuff here, some fisheries work and some stuff with different ungulates. So I did study biology um, at UBC and I uh, spent some time farming, um, working with the foods, the sacred foods. And now, you know, I'm really more focused on, on getting out on the land and just appreciating and, you know, celebrating the bounty that's right, right here, right at my doorstep. So mm -hmm. yeah, today I'm going to be cooking with some foods that uh, I harvested mostly, mostly on foot from home, uh, mostly this morning, a few things from the root cellar and, uh, odds and ends from, from some of my local farmer friends. So, uh, I guess, you know, there's this concept of ecological eating, which some of you might've heard of. And to me, it's, it's really just another kind of rebranding of an inherent indigenous concept or way of being. And What's that, Julian? Ethological eating? Is that like ethical eating? 
Well, I'll explain it here. Ecological eating is this concept that, yeah, I keep toying with this knife, so I'm going to put it over here. <laughs> um, ecological eating is this concept that, that you should be basing your diet on what's around you. So the foods you should be eating the most are those that are closest to you. Mm -hmm. And as you move outwards, those are the foods you eat less and less. Okay. And within that is seasonality. You know, now is the springtime. And here we have a later spring than a lot of you folks that are uh, tuning in from down south. But mm -hmm. in the past couple of weeks, the first of the spring greens have come out. And spring is our traditional fishing time. So lately, my diet has been primarily, you know, stinging nettles and, and fish. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. And, you know, there's beautiful teachings that, that when you eat like that, those foods will give you the exact medicine you need. Mm. And so rather than trying to follow some kind of fad diets or, you know, where they're just so bound up in this privileged mindset that we should be able to have anything from anywhere in the world whenever we want. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's built on the foundation of an industrialized food system. Mm -hmm. you know, it, just, it, it, it takes away all the, the sacredness of the beautiful food. Mm -hmm. So... And I can feel it, like, you know, in terms of just being intuitive and listening to my body. Like, when I eat the food that's right around me, it always feels right. It always mm -hmm. feels right. Mm -hmm. I go mm -hmm. to the store and get the foods, it's hit and miss. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, that Julian, I did an article um, earlier this covid season like i don't know is this how we're referring to it now <laughs> earlier this apocalypse and um it was about how covid19 is telling the world what indigenous peoples have been saying for thousands of years right and i know even just saying that i'm sure you understand kind of what that means but there was a woman um who i re interviewed in the article who shared a story with an elder from her community who talked about dead food and alive food. I don't know if those are terms that you use, but she was saying in our communities, you know, we eat alive foods. We eat and relate to foods that have life and give us life. And it's a reciprocal relationship. She said, as soon as you go to the supermarket, the food's all died or been killed. It's, it's a dead food, you know, and then you're putting that food in your body and wondering why you're not feeling healthy and alive and you know, nourished, spiritually nourished, physically nourished. Is that something that you think about too in terms of food, dead food and alive food? Because a lot of the foods that I see in front of you have life. You know, you said you just harvested most of them this morning. Do you think of food in terms of dead and alive and life? Yeah, definitely. Like, well, even water. Like I feel like uh, when I go out and get my spring water, it's just so alive. It's so charged up and mm -hmm. drinking it again, it's just like medicinal. And then mm -hmm. the stuff coming out of the tap, I don't know what's going on there, but I don't get the same vibe, you know? And here we used to have uh, like our whole reserve. We're really fortunate in that we have, have had good water and a lot mm -hmm. of Northern reserves don't, but we used to get mountain spring water from the hills behind here piped to all of our houses. Mm -hmm. Well, not that everyone has water, but all the houses that were tied into the system mm -hmm. and uh, untreated, you know, mm -hmm. right in the homes, which was beautiful. Um, but they they had to renew the infrastructure and INAC was like, oh, well, we'll only fund, um, you know, the infrastructure project if you put in a modern treatment facility so now our tap water is chlorinated. Hmm. Yeah. So, I'm, but I'm in my 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 cousin and bestie Yurita's beautiful house here, and she, her new house, and she put in charcoal filters. Mm -hmm. you know, it's cleaning out the chemicals, but it's still 
comes out of the tap and to me that water feels dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I stuck with it today. Mm. But when I'm back at my place, I just go to the spring once a week and I love that water. And it's the mm-hmm. same way with food. When you, when you um, are getting it and it's fresh and you're involved in that process and you're giving thanks as you do it, it's just such a different, different experience. And, Mm-hmm. Uh, in the store, who knows? It's harvested months before you even get to it, and treated mm-hmm. with all sorts of inhibitive chemicals to stop it from starting to decompose or trying mm-hmm. to come back to life and grow again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just don't well, trust any industrial system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I want to I want to touch base kind of near the end of the conversation around your work as a guardian, as a caribou guardian. And I really want to hear about how the caribou are doing and what it's been like in the last few weeks and everything. But let's let's continue on the conversation of food a little bit. Um, what animals, what foods do you hunt and harvest? Yeah, I'm going to start cutting some fish while I talk okay. about it because I got to get all rolling. <laughs> Um, yeah. And explain to us, ex- explain everything, but like what you're doing. Yeah. Maybe like explain when you harvested the fish, a little bit about the fish. Just feel free to talk, talk away. And if, if questions come in, I'll be sure to interrupt you. First, I'll talk about the, the sucker fish. This, so this is kind of uh, a little bit sad looking because I scaled it outside this morning. Uh, so normally they have a, a much you know, normally they have a beautiful... Can you bring him closer so we can see? Okay, I'll navigate this webcam thing. It's a sucker. It's a large-scale sucker that's been scaled. So there it is. Um, you know, and the settler community has a term for uh, this type of fish. It's called a court fish. And they're not really that suitable for eating. Well, except for they do call them Manitoba salmon. <laughs> but um, but for us, this sucker fish is uh, historically super important. There's uh, a place called Charlie Lake by Fort St. John, where the Charlie Lake Cave is, which is one of the oldest anthropological. Julian, your place. sound is a, a little bit cloudy. Your sound. I don't know oh, if it's. Yeah, I mean, now once you're talking facing, it's a little bit clear, but. Oh yeah, I'll see if I can crank it. Now up. it's good. Now it's good. We have pretty shitty internet right now with everything, but I'll see if I can adjust this mic. Audio. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I can do other than. Hope for the best. <laughs> um, how am I sounding right now? Yeah, you're fine. It's back. It's all good. Okay. So yeah, apologies, people. We have kind of limited internet right now, and with so many people at home, it's just been really slow on the res. So, I, I mean, we just we just upgraded from dial up not that long ago out here. So. <laughs> um, yeah, old stories of uh, Charlie Lake. Every spring would be a gathering place for the Dinosaur people to fish for this species of salmon um, and get, harvest a lot of them and dry them as one of our main, you know, subsistence foods. In the springtime, the ungulates aren't really in that good of shape. They're, they're, a lot of them have ticks, they're really skinny and they're struggling. And so we try to not bother them in that time and, and let them let them go through that process of getting the fresh spring greens and get back to health and, and get fat on their bodies before we start thinking about harvesting them. So spring really is a time for sucker, maybe the, some beaver. Um, but yeah, so I've been trying to work with this sucker fish and not too many people eat them anymore, but they're really, really good. They just kind of have a lot of bones. So I've been canning some and pickling some, grinding some, 
to get around the problem of, of all the bones because the meat is, is absolutely delicious. It's slightly sweet. It's kind of subtle, white flesh, leaner fish. Um, yeah. So, um, but some of the main animals we hunt here, really moose is the most commonly hunted animal and everyone, you know, it's everyone's favorite. People are partial to moose here. People go crazy over it. So I got this, we'll be cooking in moose lard from a fat mountain moose uh, that a friend of mine uh, got last fall or kind of late summer. And I went out and helped him haul it out and he gave me all the back fat and it was such a fat moose that I got like 20 jars of lard off of just its back fat. And it's like, it's so beautiful. You know, I'm going to cut this fish eventually, but I got to now talk about <laughs> because. Yeah, I hop back in. I mean, I've been listening and talking this whole time, but as soon as you're talking about moose, I'm like, I got to, I love moose. Yeah. And so fat, like lard's been kind of bastardized, right? And it's, everyone knows like, yeah, the industrial food system was trying to prioritize marketing their toxic byproduct oils of like these high processed GMO canola, sunflower, safflower, these, these heat processed vegetable oils. Um, and they're just, they're toxic. In my opinion, they are the most toxic food product in the entire mm. modern food system. Say that again. What are the most toxic? The the uh, artificial oils? Yeah, well, they're not artificial so much as that they're, they're heat processed mm -hmm. oils that are made from genetically modified seeds mm -hmm. and they're rancid at generally uh, where they're being sold, you know, at the point of sale. And, um, you know, genetically modified crops are sprayed with Roundup, which is glyphosate and two other primary chemical components that together are super toxic and have been shown to not only destroy the soil microbiome, but the microbiome of our bodies and mm. to make the tight junctions of our cellular membrane permeable, leading to all sorts of, of, of um, intest intestinal permeability and, and, and even brain permeability issues where there's a transfer of stuff in our bodies that shouldn't be happening and results in, in all sorts of issues from the kind of spectrum of autoimmune disorders to all the way to autism. And, uh, but really our cells are primarily made up of fat and they're made up of the fat that we eat. And when we eat those toxic oils, our cells become made of those toxic oils. Mm. They stay with us for years. You know, eating that bad, bad oil, you know, the one we all our cook them, fry the bannikin mm -hmm. is uh, unfortunately really harmful uh, to our bodies. Mm -hmm. And when our cells become made up of those harmful oils, they're, they're highly inflammatory. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, inflammation, inflammation is the cause of death. Mm. <laughs> so, so what what do you use instead yeah. moose lard moose lard so <laughs> again animal fat's been bastardized too because it, it's all about the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 and when animals are eating eating grain which is generally gmo well it's always like a roundup ready grain that they're using mm -hmm. in the industrial feedlots um they get high amounts of omega-6 in their fat, which uh, that can lead to all the kind of health issues that are associated with too much cholesterol. Um, but wild animals and grass-fed, grass-finished animals um, mm -hmm. have a balance ratio of omega-3 and omega-6. And the omega-3 is the really healthy fats that feed our brain and feed our skin and feed our bodies like the most luscious nutrients to keep us all juiced up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's what I want to be, Julian. I just want to be juiced up all the time. <laughs> oh, I want to be nourished. <laughs> okay, I'm taking notes. I hope other people are taking notes too. So 
pea processed oils made from genetically modified seeds, like vegetable oil, canola oil, these kind of cheap and easily accessible oils. These are super toxic. So I'm taking notes. I think they're the most if, toxic foods. The yeah. most toxic foods because then we become that, right? Yeah. Then we're actually carrying that in our, like, and that's not what we want. Okay, so that's great. So instead, you would recommend moose lard, other like, you know, coastal yeah. folks have the, the luxury of hooligan grease and- yeah. Oh, so, so fortunate. So here in my local area, I, I, do, I do bear grease. Yes. I usually harvest one bear a year, which, sorry to those of you that that offends. Uh, it doesn't- The come bear easy. clan people. Yeah, it doesn't come easy, that work, but it's something that I do and I do it with respect and I honor every part of that animal and, and mm -hmm. you know, I'll do it up where the caribou are. I'll, I'll do one there a year and you know, that's, that's it. And, uh, but that bear grease is precious medicine for us mm -hmm. and it's really yummy to eat too. And mm -hmm. so I'll do different types of lard. Um, but moose is really like moose and buffalo are my favorite. We're lucky here in that we have some buffalo we get to go hunt. And by the end of summer, they're just fat. So, and, and, yeah. and then locally, there is like organic producers of cold pressed hemp and flax oils, which, um, you know, they're grown in the north. And so if you need something for a salad, that's not like solid at room temperature, those mm -hmm. to me are, are better options because I know I can find stuff that's from not that far away. And uh, yeah. What about so, coconut oil? Yo, dude, coconut oil. There's no coconut trees anywhere near me. <laughs> well, there's coconut trees near me, so yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. I was just uh, talking to uh, our mutual friend, Charlie Gordon, I think you know him in Victoria. And he was like, we got in this big conversation about food when I was down because I was in Mexico most of the winter. Mm -hmm. And oh, so privileged, right? <laughs> but yeah, he was like, what was the one food you, you, you know, you miss the most and you just love when you're down there? And it's coconut. Coconut's amazing. You know, it's so healthy for you. It's got incredible antifungal properties. It's, it's mm -hmm. low glycemic index. It's high fiber. It's so yummy. And down where I was, there'd be like family operations where they're just working through a pile of young coconuts and putting the fresh coconut water with all the baby coconut flesh into bottles. <laughs> and then, like they would just have liters of it on yeah. ice. And sometimes they'd be grating, grating ginger from their yard and putting it in that. And I'm like, I was drinking that. Like, oh, shit. Yeah. 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 And like, I'm not going to lie. I have a tub of coconut oil in the drawer. You know, I do. Yeah. But <laughs> I would love to move away. You know, like I try to minimize my use of it. I have a jug of olive oil too. They're healthy oils. Um, mm -hmm. But I try to minimize my use of that. And mm -hmm. I have this beautiful idealistic concept in my spirit to one day, you know, not not uh, buy that stuff at all. Mm. I'm not sure it is, you know, unless I'm in the place where you should be having it. If I'm in the Mediterranean right. or somewhere in California where they got beautiful olives and they're getting grown in a good way, yeah, I meet some people that are doing it. Right. I mean, but when you when you talk about like traditional foods, because we kind of touched on the fact that I've been using wild foods, you know, like he's going to give a cooking class on wild foods. And then you have you have to stop. You have to question the English language constantly all the time. But you have to stop and be like wild foods. Like you said, it's just food. What makes it wild? Like it kind of exotifies, you wild. know, you know, it's wild. But when we, when you value and understand um, how place-based foods, you know, the power of place-based foods and everything that goes along with that, you know, that necessarily comes with the protection of territories, lands and waters that necessarily comes with, you know, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-industrial exploitation practices, right? So there's a lot 
to love about you know traditional foods and traditional food harvesting no matter where in the world you are like me being a visitor here in the south as well i feel super privileged and lucky to learn about you know the local native plants and fruits and you know i was oh. gifted some corn yesterday so i'm gonna you know boil up some corn different colors too the these corn seeds are all purples and you know yellows and oranges what am i gonna do i'm not gonna do it now but i'm gonna cook up some corn later um but i'm glad you started cutting that fish because i was thinking we were gonna just talk for hours and there's there's going to be no progress there. So is there anything we should be knowing right now about the way that you're cutting up this sucker fish? Oh, uh, well, I'm just back splitting it. Um, I'm black back splitting it, but leaving the belly on it. So this is, you know, shout out my hottest. They taught me how to back split fish, but uh, I'm coming in from the spine, you know, and cutting down to the rib cage and then just sliding the knife along the rib cage so that when the fillet comes off like this one, the ribs are no longer in it. And uh, the belly meat is still on here. And you know, there's there's good eating in the belly. Nothing's gonna go to waste here. Um, I'm gonna get these fillets off and then what's left on the fish will get turned into bone broth. Um, so, you know, no waste. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to mention about the fat, though, before we... So fat, the cool thing about omega-3 and fat is I was looking at this study that demonstrated that the higher diversity of plants that an animal is eating, the higher levels of omega-3 in its fat. So you think about these wild, wild animals, like the moose eats a lot of different things. I mean, yeah, it really likes red willow, red willow is your dogwood, but they also eat diamond willow. They in fact eat all the species of willow and they eat poplar trees and cottonwood trees, the young ones and the bark of the mature poplars. Uh, they eat birch, they love birch, you know, they eat fireweed. The big bulls up in the mountains seem to really like those fireweed blossoms. So they're just eating all kinds of stuff. And they're drinking out of mineral licks that are just, you know, these, these springs coming right out of the earth filled with all that earth mineral medicine. And uh, I just couldn't think of, you know, there's no way that, I don't think that even the best farm system could ever match the diversity uh, of just what's out on the land and what these animals are getting. So I think that's like one of the healthiest things in the world right there. That in the bone marrow. Has anyone you know ever heard like someone was telling me that bone marrow has exactly the same nutrient composition as, as breast milk, like human breast milk. So and human breast milk is probably like the perfect food for us. So kind of beautiful idea that you could get that same profile of, of nurturing as you would from your mama, hmm. from, the, from the bone marrow. From your mama. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that before. Bone marrow has the same, what was that? The same? Nutrient profile as breast milk. But Nutrient I mean, profile, nutrient profile. Yeah, so I don't know. I never seen a scientific, peer-reviewed publication to back up that statement. But oh, there's the biologist in you talking. Yeah, but I, I believe it. Like, yeah. Oh my God, when I'm doing marrow bones here, like the younger kids too, like the ones that are like the closest to breastfeeding, they're going crazy over it. They're just like, Uncle, Uncle, more. Can I have another bone? You know, like everyone loves it, but it seems like 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 toddlers and young young kids they're like right into it. So this this sucker that I'm cutting is uh, female, and so right here she's full up of rope. I was hoping to get a female. 
Um, so this is a large scale sucker row. And uh, I think that for me, I think fish eggs is, is another one of these, like one of the best, best, most nutrient dense, nourishing, healing foods you could eat. Uh, they're real fatty again with that beautiful, healthy fat. Um, yeah. And just like every one of those holds the life, you know, so, 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 so good for you and they're delicious. I've been eating a lot of these, these eggs, these sucker fish eggs lately. And like, they're just like so rich and amazingly delicious. So we're going to cook some of those up too here. Just about done boning up these suckers. I'm on the last side here of the second fish. So yeah. Um, what are your fishing practices? Yeah, I've been netting. I net in the spring. Mm -hmm. It's our traditional netting season. And uh, I try to focus close to home. So I these fish came from... Like, uh, you can't see it, but the lake's right here. Our reserve is on the lake. And uh, I just walked down to the lake, and I got a rowboat down there, and I roll out. So it's just, like, fossil fuel-free fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and it's the spot that my great-grandpa set a net. My great-grandpa, and I'm sure it goes back you know, to his ancestors. Mm -hmm. But my old uncle showed me the spot and said, you know, this was grandpa's spot. And, and now it's my spot. And, uh, and my niece, Tanisha, who is 12 years old, she's taken up the fishing with me this season. So she's been coming out and helping me work the nets and uh, sharing her stories with me out there. And she just loves it. So, yeah. And we went to the next lake over a couple days ago um, to set a net over there for some jumbo whitefish. And it was like 7 p.m. by the time we got it out. And I was like, oh, let's just leave it for the leave it for the night. We'll come back early tomorrow. And I told her, you got to be ready at 7 at the latest. And we got to get over there and get it out before some moony owls come and start messing with it or try and call the cops on us again or something. And uh, it was like quarter after six. She texted me, Uncle, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> so it's just been amazing having her. She's so, so engaged and intelligent and is always teaching me. You know, I share what I can with her, but we start, let's just say when we get into an argument, she's always right. <laughs> she sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> she loves to fish and she knows how to weave her words in a good way. Yeah, yeah. So, but I take all the kids out I can. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And my family's been getting more involved lately too. Hmm. But I've always kind of been the fisher person in the family. Uh, so I got these fillets here done up now. Mm -hmm. and I want to make a fish cake with some of these hotted potatoes, which we'll get into story story mode on the hotted potatoes here in a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so these you can see here, they're like nice, nice looking fillets. Mm. Um, Sucker fish have, in the tail section, they have a bunch of extra bones. And uh, along the top, they have a line of Y bones. And so there's a way to cut out a, a nice filet that would be totally boneless if you wanted to have a pan seared filet or just to bake it. Um, but what I'm going to do with these filets is I'm just going to poach them uh, along with the scraps. I shouldn't say scraps, but along with the, the rest of the meat that's still on the bones, I'm going to lightly poach them 
and clean that meat off and use that to make the fish cakes with. So that's an easy way. It's a bit of work because you got to clean out the bones, but it's, it's an easy way to do it. Um, so yeah, I'll just get those simmering here. Bear with me. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to keep asking you questions along the way, if that's yeah, okay. Absolutely. So, yeah, so tell me a little bit about um, any, I mean, part of this conversation around the fact that you are able to practice your fishing, hunting, and harvesting rights as an Indigenous person. In your opinion, what are some of the biggest obstacles to people practicing the right to be who they are? Yeah, I mean, gee, they're just lazy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I think that. Other than that. I'm just going to let that run out a bit here. So I think that one of the issues is well, I see with our youth, like a lot of our younger youth. They seem to really light up at those opportunities here in our community, but their folks are just so busy, you know? And like, I, I get it. Like in this day and age, I'm so busy. Mm -hmm. Like I, I work multiple jobs. I mm -hmm. build in a house. And like last year, I was so focused on trying to finish my house um, and, and keep the money coming in and that I wasn't making enough time for getting out and doing this. And uh, in the end, it left me really hurting. And so I had to really reprioritize what I was doing with this mm. life, you know, but not everyone can do that. And mm -hmm. I think we're all just busier than we've ever been as human mm -hmm. beings on the planet. Mm. You know? and, uh, and we've been put in this great time out, right? A lot of people have been talking about this time out. Um, so I wonder, I know it was just Juan Bedard, Haida language uh, teacher. I had a chat with her a couple Fridays ago and, you know, and we were talking about this time, you know, this time to kind of reassess. And it's a theme that's come up in quite a few of these conversations mm -hmm. and conversations I'm sure we're all having around this re-examination of our priorities, you know, for, for everybody, Indigenous or not, but this re-examination of really asking, am I doing the work that I'm meant to be doing? Am I fulfilling my responsibilities? Um, you know, so hopefully this time is challenging and strange and adaptive as it is. Hopefully this time is also a time for us to really just examine what we're doing and what we give energy and priority to. Absolutely, yeah. And it's not, uh, I don't know, I was listening to my favorite podcast, which is all my relations all my relations shout out to all my relations podcast yeah which uh i feel super guilty because i can't remember their names but it's two two indigenous women that are down mm -hmm. south of the border there and in, in the states and uh they just have these incredibly powerful uh voices and beautiful outlooks that I just, you know, it hits, it hits me. Their podcast always hits me. Their words always hit me in a, in a moving way where a lot of them have been like really healing medicine for me. Um, mm. Yeah, but they had one on whole family wellness, their last episode. And they had the folks the, from Fit for Culture down there, which they're mm -hmm. like it's wellness and fitness initiative has been in life mm -hmm. and uh they were talking about this article that just came out in the new york times with all these indigenous food people you know doing sacred work mm. uh, and uh and they ha they frame the story in the context of it being um like indigenous people turning back to their old ways as a response to COVID-19, you know, which it was just framed in this way, like that we're struggling and, and this is a way that we're responding to this and it's, but they just dissected that. And, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not like 
we're just doing this stuff now. It's a time immemorial lineage of harvesting these foods and this the sacred relationship around it all. So um, yeah, absolutely. This is an important time to reassess where we're putting our energy and what we're prioritizing in our life. Um, but by no means is this the inciting incident of some new <laughs> new thing for indigenous folks, you know? Like we do it and our parents did it and their grandparents and all the way back have always done mm-hmm. it and we always will. Hey. Um Yes, exactly. I mean, being somebody who gives workshops on how to decolonize uh, journalism, those are conversations that I've had. That's one of the things that uh, big newspapers, small newspapers, reporters can do, whether consciously or not, really quickly is to put that victim narrative, right? Or to, you know, to treat time as if it's linear even and saying like, this is where we are from this point here or to kind of romanticize stories as well. Like, oh, people are going back to the land, they're revitalizing traditions. And sometimes it's not accurate. Like one of the most important parts of our jobs as reporters is accuracy, right? So if it's not accurate to the truth um, of people's lived experiences and stories, then it's it's adding a tone that's not quite, not quite right. And we have a comment here Julian, just to clarify that the two podcast hosts are Matika Wilbur and Adrian Keen. So thanks oh, for sharing oh, that. Oh, that's yeah. that's- and then another comment agreeing with you saying, we've been working to heal well before COVID. Yeah, yeah. Which, is very, <laughs> which is very true. And people, folks are happy to see you working with working with fish. So what are you doing right now? So you've got fish, what's so, happening? I took the, all the bones that were left from filleting and uh, and those fillets, and I just put them all in a pot here with some water, and I'm gonna just give them a little boil. That's the most traditional, you know, my cookum. She just boil everything. <laughs> so this is ode to my cookum. I'm gonna give this fish a boil. <laughs> Are you talking about uh, your dad's mom? Well, actually, my dad's, my dad's grandma. Grandma. Who raised yeah. Me. Yeah. I've seen pictures so of that lady. Yep. Yeah, so, so she was around for all of my childhood and youth, and I lived with her sometimes, and she didn't speak English, and I don't really speak that much Cree, but we had a, we had a way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to add some salt to that. Mm-hmm. And salt have been like on this kind of like salt journey too. Like, mm-hmm. were we getting salt back in the day? Like, we kind of need salt and the trace minerals in it. And I uh, consulted some folks, and actually, my dad was the first story about salt. And mm-hmm. he had heard that we used to go to some salt lakes in central Alberta. Um, to gather salt there and I started digging around and sure enough there's a few lakes there where there's so much salt that the salt just dries on the shore uh, but now I don't know if it's clean enough there's cottages around the one lake and I would be so I don't know I think it would be so amazing to go on a trip you know down that way and talk to the to the folks there um, I'm not sure it might have been, I'm not sure if it was all the way down in Blackfoot territory, but, you know, figure that out and go there in a good way and ask permission and and see if we could get salt there again. Um, this salt I'm going to use today, I got when I was down visiting and doing some work in Peru, and it's from, uh, from the Andes, from the morass salt salt line which has been a sacred salt harvesting place for since pre-inca times down there and uh indigenous folks continue to harvest uh salt from that place and it's just some of the most beautiful salt i've ever worked with in my life Uh, it's loaded with minerals it's not processed at all and yeah 
It doesn't have any of those microplastics. Not that I'm like worried about that. Like if I could, uh, if any of you are in, you know, our coastal areas and are making salt, hit me up. Uh, I'll trade you my life some salt <laughs> no but seriously wow. i'm trying to find some salt connection like okay I, do you hear that julian's looking for trading some salts what will you trade in return like what would be a fair trade in your mind for what quantity of salt not chaga. your life i'll trade chaga chaga can you explain chaga. what chaga is uh it's what i'm drinking right now hmm I'll go get a piece real quick and show you. Oh, now I'm going to be jealous. Here's a picture of Julian's grandmother that he was speaking about. Strong Cree lady, Art Napoleon's grandmother. And then Art. Is a... Then is a... She's not Cree. I tried to make so her this Cree. Chaga. Chaga. And so that's the surface. It's a conch type fungus that grows on birch trees. And a conch -type fungus. Yeah, it is uh, possibly conch. Most likely the most powerful antioxidant on the planet. Wow. It's, an it's antiviral, immune booster. And it's delicious. It's got vanilla in it, which is, you know, what gives vanilla its, its flavor. So it has a real kind of vanilla, subtle hint of vanilla. It's really earthy. And I'm trying to, you know, not drink the coffee lately. So mm. this has been a real amazing <laughs> substitute. It's even better than coffee. I'm in coffee country, so I still... Still keep oh. my coffee close. But if I had some of that chaga tea, like you've gifted me before, I would definitely yeah. be it's really, really good. So once yeah. it's in that conch form, what do you do? Do you smash it up? Do you just boil yeah. it? Do you have to filter it afterwards? Or how do you get to the drinkable tea? You can break it up. Some people grind it, but I don't know. I know some people that just throw in a chunk. And if it's winter time, I'll put it in a pot on the wood stove mm -hmm. and I'll give it a long simmer mm -hmm. um, but right now I have a slow cooker full of it going right now so like about a half of that would fill up a large slow cooker and mm -hmm. you can give it 24 hours on low and uh, but you can keep refilling it like for a few days you can just hit hit some more water in there mm -hmm. and keep it going continuous brew so I just added um, to the fish I added some Labrador, Labrador tea leaves or muskeg leaves, which uh, that's our main, main traditional tea here. Everyone drinks it. Everyone loves it. They like to mix it with red rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's a nice, it adds a nice flavor to soup stocks, I find. So that, and then... Just because I have them, I'm going to put some a few different pot herbs in there. So this is mm -hmm. parsley from my garden that I just mm -hmm. dehydrated. Dehydrated parsley. He put in Indian tea, Indian and tea leaves. My mom's down there in the shared territories of the Tsleil-Waututh. Skohomish and Musqueam people, and in her yard she has a bay tree. Bay. So when I go visit my mom, I'll harvest some of her bay, and so I have a jar of it here. And like bay it's leaves. Not, it's nothing like the bay you get in the store. That bay that grows fresh. Mm. It's like so floral. Just the smell of it makes my mouth start watering. Wow. I'll put a couple of those in there, and uh, and then. Maybe just uh, get into these herbs here. I got some chives from the garden. Some chives. Nido, and, uh, and also 
oh, I got a little bit of tarragon from my garden. The plant started growing again. So I'll just throw a little bundle of greens in there too, in with the boiling fish. Okay. Yeah. And that's oh my the- gosh. I thought I would be okay, but I'm like, <laughs> just really hungry now. Not even hungry, just, you know, yearning for these Northern traditional foods. Yeah. Okay. So you got the fish brew stewing yeah. and got, you've got dehydrated parsley, you've got muskeg tea, you've got bay leaves, chives from the garden, nettle, tarragon. So just lots of herbs. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, and we'll put a piece of giant kelp in there too. Kelp. A piece of giant kelp. And then you said you already put in salt? Yeah, I put in a pinch of that Peruvian salt that I got when I was down there. And I'm just going to put in, uh, this is some giant kelp that I harvested on my kayak when I was living in Haida Gwaii. Mm-hmm. And it's tasty stuff. So, And it, it also super high in minerals and I'll add a bit more salt. Mm-hmm. So there's another big lesson here. Keep your trade relations strong, hey? Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to add one more interesting thing. So we've been having a lot of burdock get around their reserve from some hay that came in. Okay. Someone brought hay for their horses. We didn't have burdock here not that long ago, and now it's popping up everywhere. And Mm -hmm. my uncle brought some hay home that had burdock in it, and it started growing here around our house. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very aggressive plant, but -hmm. it's also a powerful medicine and a food. And so I've been trying to manage it or work with it, I guess. I don't want to manage it. It's probably managing me, but I've <laughs> <laughs> been going out and picking it and eating it. I got this damn tame elk that lives in my yard, and he brought the the bur, the burrs from my uncle's horse pasture over to my place. So now I'm like eating all the ones that grow in my yard. As soon as they come up, I eat them. <laughs> Really you good. have a comment, Julian. You have a comment here that says, "Find a mineral lick utilized by ungulates, and you'll find your salt and other minerals like magnesium." Yeah, no, I know. I heard, that's a really cool comment, and I had heard stories of people making salt from the mineral licks. And I know where there's lots of licks, but oh, they're just all full of moose piss. I don't want to eat it. <laughs> you know, if I found one. Like the moose are in them all, and the elk are in there, and the deer. Okay, well, to our friend who did that comment, if you have any links to moose pissless mineral licks, let <laughs> Julian know. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's one I've been thinking about. It's really high in the mountains, and it's kind of rocky, and the moose are in there. But at the headwater of the spring, I think you might be able to do that. So mm-hmm. that would be a project. Um, so I just chopped up a piece of that burdock mm-hmm. and this is a two year old root. I can tell by the size. So it's, it's, it's starting to get a little woody, but super yummy. It's bitter, mm-hmm. but it's like got this umami to it. Like it's just like rich at the mm-hmm. end. Super good. And so, so good. I'm doing this spring cleanse kind of right now. So. I'm eating lots of liver fortifying foods. So the burdock, the nettles, and I also have some dandelion greens I picked here. They're like mm-hmm. the trifecta of like liver nurturing, liver cleansing medicines. Do Say that food? again, just so we hear you nice and clear. So liver cleansing medicines for people who might be interested in a spring cleanse of your organism are? Nettle. Dandelion and burdock are all really good ones. Great. Yeah. So I got that burdock root and I'll put that in there too. Just add a little something, something. And then um, I'm just going to get another pot of water boiling for the potatoes. Great. Hi, these Haida potatoes, can you explain what you mean by Haida potatoes? No, we're going to get into that, but I got to talk about one other thing first. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I wanted to talk about chives a bit more because here 
we have two types of wild onions. We have the nodding onion and we have wild chives. Mm -hmm. And the wild chives are like, I, well, yeah, we're using that term again, wild. <laughs> <laughs> What's a better term? <laughs> well, the term traditional is weird too, right? I've heard yeah. a lot of people take issue with the term traditional. Like, are, can we just say nourishing foods or can we say place-based foods or can we say indigenous foods? Like, anyway, yeah, <laughs> there's chives that grow out in the bush and they're exactly the same as the chives in the garden. They're really good, they're beautiful. Um, but the main, main place they grow is right along the Peace River in the flood zone for the Sight Sea Dam. So, and they've been just devastating the land in there right now. Um, but yeah, along that entire river in that area that's slated to be flooded, those chives grow along the bank, bank on both sides. And uh, so I'd really like to go in there and transplant some of those ones to uh, the Moberly River here in right front of my place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so maybe I'll get out there Coming back from the caribou pen, I'll go in there in a couple of weeks and mm -hmm. dig up uh, dig up some of those and put them down by where we planted that sweet, sweet grass. grass. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Um, not to get too much into the site C conversation, but I'm just the one question I do have is during this COVID nineteen um, time, has that activity Altered at all, slowed down, or have they continued construction? No, they've continued full on. Uh, the kind of response because industry work, mining, oil and gas, and site C were all deemed as essential services. And uh, so, like, I know site C is kept working. I've heard multiple rumors of there being a ton of cases of COVID there. Like mm. I even heard, I even heard that there was a like an entire COVID section of the camp. Jeez. Like the isolation camp from the main camp. So I don't know. These are just stories I'm hearing from guys. Uh, I don't go over there. I haven't even been able to bring myself to go through the Peace River Valley since I got home from Mexico because I'm it's just so I allowed to swear? Yeah, absolutely. So, it's so fucking emotional going through there and seeing, because every time you go through, the destruction is just growing. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just can't always handle going to that heavy place, because if I go there, it's going to be full-on breakdown. So I'll go with my tobacco, and I'll go get those chives, and I'll, I'll go through it then. Mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. do, my, do what I can in my own little way. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. And then like, so Coastal Gas Link, right, which was basically the main thing in the media before mm -hmm. COVID was over. I mean, it's coming from here. It's coming from my territory and mm -hmm. right by my community, not far. And uh, their response was to double down on production. So they started, the COVID shutdown happened and they started working night and day. They never stopped punching that pipeline through. Where all you crazy youth down there are in lockdown. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's kind of super sad. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. the way they're You know, and honestly, they shouldn't be working at all. And, mm -hmm. and there's so many reasons why neither of those projects should be happening. So many reasons. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, the fact that construction not only continued, but doubled down while people were quarantined um, and trying to practice these social distancing measures for the health of community, especially elders and young ones and, you know, people more prone to getting the virus, the fact that all levels of government and the proponents were more than willing to keep that construction going and vamp it up was like, 
a clear message, you know, it's just like very clear that that that, you know, as much as a lot of people are questioning the way that big industry has led to climate change, you know, this term, this climate crisis to the point where we are today, that that message isn't really being understood by all um, all involved is like, it's what what is it going to take, you know? Well, it takes. For sure. But anyways, so chives, you're going to harvest chives before the site C folks get their, their hands on them. Yeah. So check it out. Oh, everything's reversed on this webcam. That's very that bumpy. A prime hide of potato. Beautiful. So uh, these came out of my garden and I planted them. Actually, you were up here doing the caribou story. And we did a little ceremony for my planting of the garden. Wasn't that last year? Wasn't that last year or the year before? It's last year, but I'm with you in terms of we did that being one. very confused about the dates. For anyone who's interested in that caribou story that we've mentioned a few times, I've posted it here in the comments. So feel free to have a read later on. Yeah. So that came from that time i did that plant we did the ceremony and i did my plantings and these potatoes are from then mm -hmm. and uh, i stored them when i went down to guatemala and mexico i stored them in my friend's root cellar all winter long and i just got them out of there uh two days ago out of nice. root and they're just like perfect they're perfect you know so cool I also had um, these fermented pickles that I made with uh, the, the cucumbers and the dill and the garlic are all from the Peace River Valley, mm -hmm. um, from the rustic market garden farm there that my friend Kate and her mama run. Um, mm -hmm. Seller too, which was super cool. Like it's cold up here, and you can just have like a little cave in the ground, and you can put all everything in there. And, it's good. You don't need a fridge. Wow. Cave in the ground. Yeah. Wow, pickles. I love pickles. So to make pickles, you just have cucumbers, dill. What else did you put in there? Oh, yeah. So uh, you make a brine, which is I put four tablespoons of kosher salt or non-iodized salt. It could be beautiful. Um, salt like this, this unprocessed stuff from Peru or mm -hmm. that real salt that they get from the States or sea salt that's not been processed or iodized in any way, just a natural mm -hmm. salt. Um, four tablespoons I put in to uh, well, about a tablespoon to a liter. I can't remember if I put a tablespoon or two tablespoons to a liter, but it's a fair amount of salt. But if you just look up like a basic brine, there's lots of recipes, but it's just salt water. And then you put all that stuff into like a big ceramic crock or a jar and cover it with a cloth. Mm -hmm. and let it go right. for a week of fermenting. Those ones I made, I was living in the wall tent and I made them, it took two weeks because it was fall and it was kind of cool. It's ferment mm. slower, it's cool. But this is like a, Right now I got some, I'm making sauerkraut and kimchi. So I got two different crocs going right now in the house and check out this beautiful tablecloth from Oaxaca. Mm. <laughs> There's just so many good foods happening in your space. Yeah, so I got the potatoes on the go, the fish is on the go. I think um, we got enough time to jump into a hide a potato story which isn't really my story to share. So I apologize um, in advance because I'm going to tell it anyway, because I love it so much. And <laughs> if I'm in trouble, I will repay my debts when I come back over there, okay? So just let me know and I'll make it up to your whole family. <laughs> uh, but how to potato is super cool. Okay, first of all, look again at it. It's like this totally unique, shape it's a true potato it's a waxy 
fingerling type potato, which means it's low on the glycemic index. Um, so if you have problems like diabetes or blood sugar issues, uh, this is a great potato to eat because it's not going to create such a spike of sugar in your system. And uh, they are uh, genetically, a genetically distinct potato. So they are in Peru still, this exact same potato. They're in Haida Gwaii and uh, I believe it's Maca. They're a tribe in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington state. They have them too. Um, and then this is unconfirmed, but they're possibly in Hawaii and nowhere else in the world. They are not in Spain. Um, and so it's been indigenous people that have held these potatoes and grown these potatoes since time immemorial. However, the commonly held origin theory uh, within the settler community and the academic dialogue is that these potatoes were, were introduced to Haida Gwaii by Spanish ships, <laughs> which is just such a, such a joke. Um, the story that I like uh, that Walker Brown told me when I was hanging out with him one afternoon in Skidigit is that uh, the Haidas took their canoes down to Peru, all the way down to Peru, and uh, they brought this potato back with them, and they dropped it off at a few, a few spots on their way home. Mm. And uh, when the Spaniards showed up starving on their deathbeds, the Haidas were generous enough to give them canoe loads of these potatoes to save their lives. And when you look at the genetics, when you look at the distribution, when you look at the skill of the Haidas um, mm -hmm. and their teaching ways, you know, and then also the oral history, like Walker's story kind of come to him. I mean, he's got some crazy theories, that guy, if any of you know him, but he's an awesome dude. And, and, you know, he said that he had pieced that story together um, from stories that had been shared with him. And, like, you can just feel that that's the truth. So they were growing this potato from Peru, pre contact, pre European contact, mm -hmm. which is awesome, you know? Uh, Nothing gets me quite as excited as the old varieties of foods that we as indigenous people um, had these kind of reciprocal relationships of carrying across landscapes and growing, um, you know, so, and we'll talk a bit more about that, but I just love, I love, love, love that history. There's no mm -hmm. other history gets me more excited. Um, you know, one of our ancestors is a Iroquois man, and uh, I would love to spend some time out in the Iroquois territory and learn about the seeds that they keep and uh, their traditions around it. Because mm -hmm. this, this potato, so I came, I got this potato um, when I was in Haida Gwaii. I brought it here with me to the piece, and now I grow them here. And they do really good here. Some of them got huge. These are just, I saved the huge ones to replant in the garden. These are just the little ones. So mm. yeah, but they're, they're really, really good. Um, yeah, super cool. They also have a tobacco, like had a tobacco. And crazily enough that the relative of that tobacco is in the, in like the Dakotas. Hmm. Yeah, and Walker was like, oh, yeah, we got that from there. We took our canoes up the Columbia River to get over to their territory and brought those seeds back to Haida Gwaii. And he gave me some of the tobacco seeds, but unfortunately, they didn't germinate. Hmm. Different seeds have come to me. Someone sent me some Iroquois tobacco seeds in the mail recently. So, hmm. yeah, the sacred tobacco. Um, Somebody sent me some, it's hard to receive packages where I am. It's hard to receive anything 
a friend, Vernon Williams, uh, who was on this interview series a couple weeks back, he was like, hey, can I send you some seaweed? You know, from Haida Gwaii as well, Haida. I thought, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, but it's, you know, it, it's difficult uh, to receive packages where I am right now, but I hopefully do have some sage on the way. So, you know, they, they, have, a, they have some sage here, um, which is fluffy. It's like this white, air white sage here in the Cejado um, that I'm, and I'm in one of the ecosystems that is a part of this region, which is really comprised of three different ecosystems, the Transatlantic, uh, more of a drier Katinga ecosystem, and then the Cejado. They have a white sage that grows, which is quite beautiful, but it has a different, obviously a different spirit, a different smell, a different use relationship. So um, I'm having some white sage sent to me so I can keep, you know, working with her and being with her and, smudging myself and others along the way during these times. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. I hope it gets to you. I'm sure it will. I know. I'll let you know. I'll let <laughs> you know. Okay. So what else do you have on the table? Okay. So, oh, I'm just going to throw these in with the potatoes. It's just a few more. These are one-year-old burdock roots. Okay. And, uh, I'm just going to throw them in there for add a little bit of their nuttiness and depth of flavor in with those potatoes. So these will go in the compost. So the other thing I'm going to do as an accompaniment to the fish cakes, which I don't know if we're going to make it for noon. We might have to go over time a little bit. <laughs> we will. We'll be right on time. So uh, I just went out in my yard this morning and I got obviously the nettle, the stinging nettle, which I like to handle without gloves because it's medicine. Yeah. Um, and then these are Colt's foot. So Colt's foot are really mostly known as a, as a respiratory system medicine. They're leaves. Good for this time, hey? Yeah, but when they first, the first thing they send up in spring is a flower shoot. And uh, there it is, the colt's foot flower. And the stalk is delicious, they're really good. Um, and then afterwards, once the leaves emerge, it's too late to eat it as a food. Then you harvest the leaves to drink as a tea. So there's this little window there's like a week where it shoots up these flowers and if you can get them at the right time, they're really tasty. Um, and then I got little, little baby fireweed shoots. So these are just starting to come up. And when they're this baby, like when they're bigger, you can peel them and eat them. But when they're this baby, you can just eat the whole shoot. You don't have to worry about peeling it. They're just tender. Um, they're yummy. I think my friend Tiffany called them asparagus of the north on her IG. <laughs> um, dandelion. So they're just starting to come up. Uh, dandelion. And then the other one I found was, uh, I call them bluebells. They're also called lungwort. Um, but their baby leaves are super yummy. They mm -hmm. taste kind of like a cucumber. Julian, we have a comment here from a friend, Rustin Fellows, who says you can burn those to make salt. Yeah, the colt's foot leaves. The colt yeah. foot, yeah. Y'all are super knowledgeable. This is cool. We got like the best people watching this. I wish <laughs> we could, like have an actual like hands-on workshop together where we just share knowledge out on the land. One day, the seeds are planted now anyways. Yeah, oh, there's Tiffany too. She's like, yeah, boreal asparagus. So, and Tiffany actually was the one who told me about the colt's foot salt because she made it uh, too. And mm. so, yeah, so I might try that. I'm still hoping that someone on the North Coast is gonna trade me some sea salt, but. Mm. Uh, Okay. Rustin yeah. says he'll send you the link. He's going to comment with a link so we can all learn how to burn to make salt. Awesome. 
That's a great hat you got. Oh, Rustin's a cool guy. He was, uh, we did a fast together, a four day, four day fast and, you know, at the foot of the Twin Sister Mountains there, place of prophecy, like you've spoken about before. And on our last day of the fast, uh, Rustin came face to face with a mama grizzly bear. Whoa. Came face to face with her and they had a little bit of a stare off and a standoff. And like you said, it's not my story to tell, so I'll leave it there. But I always have really good memories of that fast and of Rustin and of the standoff of that bear and yeah. Yeah, so, wow, that's, that's so cool, you did that, and the Twin Sisters, aww. <laughs> so, what else we got? Um, I'm going to do these braised greens, and I'm going to serve it with a, with a, the fish cakes and the braised greens are going to be with a sauce that, this is, uh, this is a, I'm going to get real bougie. Hashtag indigenous excellence. Oh, Although this is not really a Turtle Island indigenous food, but this is creme fraiche. Creme fraiche? <laughs> How do you say that? I don't know. <laughs> it's, what it is, it's made with kefir grains. And mm -hmm. so this is, this is organic, grass fed, mm -hmm. raw, cream for my mm -hmm. friend's farm and I won't mention them because of our bogus legislation saying that raw dairy is illegal right mm -hmm. and it's serious mm -hmm. trouble but mm -hmm. raw dairy is the only dairy we should ever be eating because it has mm -hmm. the digestive enzymes in it the same as the ones in our body and so when you drink this stuff or eat this stuff, you're able to digest it and access the nutrients in it. Um, so yeah, this is that pure cream from a beautiful local farm from Heritage, some old belted Galloway cow, or no, not the, the dairy cow isn't belted, but there's cool old cows and uh, fermented with kefir. So it's like, a, it's like a sour cream kind of creme fraiche thing, but it's like super loaded with probiotics, super healthy. And uh, we're gonna just mix that with like some chives mm -hmm. and salt and have it as a, uh, oh, and, uh, and the pickles. I'll mince up some of my fermented pickles. Oh my God. <laughs> with the cream, right? And it'll be like a tartar sauce for the fish cake. Um, and then what else we got this? This is from the same farm and this is their raw cultured butter. So again, organic grass fed. So this is, you can see the difference of a truly grass fed, like it's like orange, you know, mm -hmm. they got nice, rich pasture there. And those cows are just like the happiest cows. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this butter is amazing. It's lightly fermented. So again, it's like super easy for your body to deal with. Oh, I'm so hungry now. Yeah. And then I got some eggies for uh -huh. a binder in the fish cakes. And these eggs came from my new friend, Tiffany. She is up in the comments there. She's watching right now. Mm -hmm. um, and from Fourth Sister Farm on IG. And uh, she is amazing, doing amazing work. She's an amazing person. So she's Shikwatmik, and mm -hmm. uh, she is an indigenous sea keeper. And she's here up in my territory, mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful place, um, beautiful farm, where she is doing all kinds of work around uh, saving seeds and growing seeds and acclimatizing seeds to the north and she just has the most amazing collection of mm. seeds and, plants and you know mm. she's in a good way and we were put in touch by of all people don morrison don morrison shout out to don so many good connections yeah so don who if any of you caught her show don has been uh I would say Don has been the biggest mentor to me in my life. Mm, wow. 
Yeah. So, um, but yeah, she connected us because Tiffany was working with Dawn after I kind of left and was no longer having the capacity to be involved with the working group on Indigenous food sovereignty in the way I used to be. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I went up there and uh, I brought her some white fish and some nettles and Tiffany traded me some pickled carrots and some eggs. And uh, so, yeah, we'll use some of these amazing eggs and, you know, some cool, I think those are from like Oracanas or something. They're slightly bluish and mm -hmm. those chickens are super free range. They're just like cruising around her yard all day. So good, mm -hmm. healthy things. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I have one other thing here that we didn't talk about, mm -hmm. which is this cinnamon. Mm. Cinnamon is obviously not grown around here, but <laughs> this cinnamon is, oh, so this cinnamon oh. is from Guatemala. And, uh, Say that it's again? From, it's from Guatemala. Okay. Yeah. And is growing uh, by a collective of Mayan farmers mm -hmm. and a friend of mine works with them and mm -hmm. brings up their stuff here. He has a little shop in Clinton mm -hmm. and uh, he basically, he doesn't take any cut or anything. He just works closely with that community and mm -hmm. they're, they're land-based activists, land defenders, and he brings their stuff up and sells it here. Um, and hundred percent of the proceeds go to support those Mayan farmers. Do you so know the name of this collective? Like, I can't mention the guy's name because, you know, he is so under the radar. Oh, okay. <laughs> but there's a little shop. He probably won't be there, but if you're like, I can't remember the name of the shop, but if you're like driving through Clinton, which is a tiny little town in the southern interior, um, mm -hmm. kind of by like, by Cash Creek area, between Cash Creek and 100 Mile House, there's a little shop there, middle of town, left-hand side of the highway. And uh, just like look for freaky hippie shit, and you're onto it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, but you know the the cinnamon that's all over Mexico because cinnamon, you know, canela is super popular in Mexico. It's super popular in Guatemala. It, they grow it all over there, and the cinnamon they grow is the true cinnamon, the Cilion cinnamon, which mm. is. You know, the cinnamon we buy now in the store, unless it says so, is cassia cinnamon, which is a mm -hmm. tiny cinnamon that doesn't have the same medicinal properties as the cilion. And mm. as a, as the cilion, to me, is just so much sweeter. Like, it's... The smell of this is, like, one of the most beautiful things you would ever smell. Um, it's sweet, 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 and floral. It's lighter colored, and... <laughs> Yeah, so this I got, I traded them some chaga and they traded me like some cinnamon and cardamom mm -hmm. and coffee and chocolate and different stuff from the mining collective. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do some, I have the chaga in the slow cooker and I'm going to put some in there with some of this Cilion cinnamon and some of the raw cultured butter <laughs> as a... Uh, beverage accompaniment but i think i might do that right away because i'm getting thirsty yeah what are those um what did the crossfit people call that coffee that they put butter in oh, yeah bulletproof it's bulletproof yeah. yeah this is way better than bulletproof coffee this is oh, like yeah. chocolate, cinnamon you know? butter yeah. i mean this is just changing the way i want to eat all the time. I always try and eat well, right? Alive foods, local foods, have a relationship with your foods. But then, then there are bougie natives like you that just step it up, 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 up. And you're just like stepping up the game. Now I'm like questioning my cinnamon. I'm questioning my salt, which is good. I'm, I'm happy to question these things. What else should we question? Oil, oil, cinnamon, salt, our butters, right? <laughs> like obviously cheeses. Um, so that, <laughs> What about you, sugar? You should question everything except the natural law. That's, wow. We just ended there. I'm just going to close my computer. Call it a day. Question everything 
except natural law. I mean, I feel like that's kind of what we've been saying over and over again, except natural law. Oh, yeah. Yep. So don't mind me. I'm just off screen here ladling some chaga out of the slow cooker. Okay, that's that's not a problem. That chaga has such an earthy, I mean, for lack of a better adjective, earthy, but it really does have that rich, thick, earthy. How do you know, Julian, for example, how do you know if you've put, if you need more water? Like I've made some chaga tea before where I'm like, whoa, I don't know. I think I need a little more water or some like almond or oat milk or something to kind of, I've made it too strong sometimes. But you said just a small piece is good enough. Yeah, like you don't need much, but, and then like, if it's too strong, just add more water. Right. You know, trust, trust and just make it to your taste. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm going to put a little salt in here too, just a pinch. Hmm, that's strange. I don't know. Trying to bring out the flavor, hey? Salt and butter and everything. I know. Have, did you, have you ever been to Brazil? No. So they work a lot with uh, mandioca vegetable and yeah. in a lot of different ways, mandioca. And one of the ways is to like harvest it and then um, make a flour out of it. And then from that flour, you make something called like tapioca, but it's, um, you know, you kind of use a filter and you put the flour on a hot frying pan and then you can put anything in that tapioca. And I eat tapioca like every day here, like just love tapioca because it's really light, right? There's no, there's no gluten. It's really light and you can put, you know, scrambled eggs and avocado and tomato and basil and whatever you want inside of it. It's delicious. It's crispy and amazing, but you can also just put butter and salt, right? And so sometimes there's days when it's just like tapioca, butter, salt every day it's really yeah. good really delicious yeah oh ah, okay i'm gonna turn on the vitamix here shout okay. out vitamix. i'm looking for that sponsorship money <laughs> <laughs> if, if vitamix is paying attention which they're not but that's okay um <laughs> great so who are you going to be feeding this meal to do you have folks that are able to eat because i mean i just i've never wished that i was able okay. to time travel before just wait just a sec i'm gonna crack this thing on here okay. does anyone have any questions for julian by the way anyone who's listening you can feel free to leave any questions he knows everything so now's your time he literally knows everything <laughs> about food. I'm just kidding. He doesn't know everything. But he knows some things. So the timer went off. The fish is cooked. Mm, we can yeah, smell it. Yeah. Check out what happens. See that? Just a little, I put like a little stick of butter, like maybe a tablespoon and a half in that cinnamon. And then it gets like this big froth happening. So yummy. And Jeez. if I wasn't on I would put a, a teaspoon of honey from uh, you're, you're on a sugar cleanse I'm not doing sugar I'm not doing any gluten um, and obviously like no processed foods or anything just as a temporary thing uh, it was a little wild down in Mexico so I'm just you know springtime mm -hmm. is a time to cleanse and mm -hmm. uh, so I'm focusing on yeah I'm pretty much yeah, I'm like grain free right now. And I actually haven't been eating potatoes temporarily. I haven't been eating any uh, kind of carbohydrate dense foods mm -hmm. just for a few weeks here. And how do you feel two weeks later? How have you felt with this cleanse? Like I had a bit of a breakout in my face and getting over it um, mm -hmm. and just days of really low energy, like brain fog. And, uh, but I, I'm like coming out of that now. And now my energy is like strong. You know, I'm doing no alarm, just waking up at six and doing like body weight training in a cold shower and just feeling like good. Like I'm turned up right now. 
Whoa, <laughs> look at you go. And after that chaga tea with the butter in it, I mean, that's going to be a nice little boost too. Do you put butter in your tea or coffee because you like the creaminess that it gives or is there a specific health benefit that you'll get as well? I just find like, um, because I'm not having milk or whatever. And like you say, that chaga can be pretty strong. Yeah. And I find like with the butter in it, it just gets so creamy and mm -hmm. silky. <laughs> it's like plush. I love it. I just love the way it, tastes. <laughs> it feels on my tongue. Great. Well, I don't have chaga tea, but I'm going to make some coffee later and put some butter in it. Just try and the butter is pretty well sourced here as well, which is good small market. Oh, yeah. Oh, in Mexico and Oaxaca, they have that too. Like in the markets, they just got creamerias or whatever, and you can get like fresh made butter in it. But like, mm -hmm. they just have a big, it's so cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I gotta I'm gonna pull this fish out of the hot stock because okay. I wanna debone it and it'll take way longer to cool in that mm -hmm. stock. So I'm gonna pull it out of there and let it cool off a little bit so I can handle it and start cleaning that meat off. Mm -hmm. and, but I'll pull it out and while it's cooling, I'll start prepping the other ingredients that I want to put in with the fishy cakes. Great. And maybe we'll make that sauce too. How are we doing for time? Half hour. Mm. <laughs> You're good. Yeah, if we go over a little bit, will I get in trouble? No, I mean, I don't think there's any kind of limits. I don't oh. have, you know, this is what I have going on. <laughs> I think everybody's kind of in the same situation. We're all working from home, whatever, wherever that home may be. So fish yeah. cakes. Do you make fish cakes? I mean, you obviously eat fish often. Do you make fish cakes often or do you do, do you make fish soup? Do you do all kinds of different things with fish? Are you currently writing a, you know, fish cookbook? Are you going to be blogging? Like where can we learn more about? Okay. <laughs> so, um, that was a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> I know, I'm the worst at that. <laughs> First one was like, how are you cooking your fish? So mostly I've been like scaling all my fish and keeping the skin on and then filleting mm -hmm. it both and pan searing it in loose lard so it has crispy, crispy skin. And it's just Whoa. so good. Like, like I love the crispy skin. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll hit it in a real hot pan and get it like mm -hmm. just there, but it's still like medium rare in the center mm -hmm. and uh, I really really like it like that so I do a lot of that um, in fact I've been eating that I generally don't eat until noon I do the intermittent fasting thing um, but for my lunch and dinner meal I will I've been eating pan-seared fish every day for two weeks <laughs> um, with nettles and greens and uh, and then I take all the bones and I just I just do the bone broth every day, pot of bone broth, and I try and just drink the whole pot. So yeah, um, but yeah, canning it, pickling it, and I'm gonna go. I'm going to work for two weeks at the caribou pen. When I get out, I'm gonna go fishing for trout, and uh, those I'll just leave whole. Like it's nice to have. They're just kind of two, three pound trout where I'm going and. It's nice to have some whole trout. You can bake them. Or sometimes if my family's hanging out by the fire, I'll just throw some on the fire out there and feed everyone. Um, oh yeah, you asked who's coming to eat and no one's home right now. I could text some cousins, see who's home next door. Maybe we'll do that in a little bit. We'll get on the phone and text some people, see if they want to eat. But um, Okay, and then you were like, what are you doing? You asked if I was uh, going to start blogging, or <laughs> um, I haven't had such an intention to blog and podcast. I've had this mm -hmm. intention a year now, mm -hmm. and and I'm, I'm also been writing a book, and I've worked more on writing the book. Um, I was working on it down in Oaxaca, and uh, I do it a bit at the Caribou Pen in the evenings. Mm -hmm. I really do want to blog because I don't know, like if blogs even matter anymore. 
I want to blog and I want to podcast just because I want to share stories. And here in my community, it's great. I have my family that I get to come out harvesting with me. But if there's like I hang out mostly with kids and elders, and I love that. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful. But I would love to connect with more um, like young adults that have, you know, that are into what I'm into. And I feel like maybe online there's the potential to foster that community and um, just to share stories of Indigenous abundance and Indigenous health. And, you know, we're all the smartest, hardest working, most beautiful people I know are Indigenous. And, you know, we just don't get that story. So I would love the opportunity to highlight my, the incredible uh, folks in my extended community um, and to share with them and to build and foster community. And I don't know, I try to well, minimize my, my digital device use, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a millennial, I'm an old millennial, so I'm in there. <laughs> So you have a comment here. I mean, it's something that came to my mind as well. I think, especially with foods, for me at least, like the visual is such an important part of it. Like some of the photos that you post on your Instagram, and everyone should go follow Napoleon, uh, Julian Napoleon on Instagram. But some of the photos that you, and I have a couple here, like they just, I think photos can obviously speak, you know, even more so than words sometimes. So I think whatever you end up doing, if you have some kind of photo involved in it. Julian, what are you holding here in this photo? Oh, that's a wood bison liver. And what, how do you cook that? Uh, generally, I'll slice it thin and fry it in lard. And liver is intense. Like liver, for those that have tried it, can be pretty strong, but it's so healthy for you. And I find buffalo liver in particular to be like yummy. Like some livers I struggle with. If it's like an old elk, I struggle eating that liver. Um, mm. Even an old moose. But I find the buffalo liver is really mild. Um, it's loaded with, with vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. especially like the B complex vitamins that um, mm -hmm. can be more challenging to get. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. That was a successful buffalo hunt, and uh, what I did, like, I, I divvied that liver up because it's so massive into kind of manageable pieces. <laughs> so and huge. Vacuum sealed it and froze it, and I've eaten the whole thing now over a year <laughs> or less than a year. So, yeah, I, 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 I can't waste the liver. So what I do, like, if I if I get a real like dank liver off of some old kind of old ruddy bones. <laughs> I will uh, I will dehydrate it and powder it and then put it in gelatin caps and just take it as a supplement. Jeez. Okay, so if you have a real dank liver that you've gotten off of an old bull, you can dehydrate and powder and make... Okay, this is good, good information. Quite, um, I remember when I visited your territories, you made a meal that I'll always remember. It was elk tongue tacos. Oh, yeah. Right? right? So that's why I think there needs to be a cooking show with Julian, because elk tongue tacos, that was some of the best tacos I've ever had. When I first saw the elk tongue in the sink, I was like, I'm not what, you know, like if somebody's cooking, I'm not going to question it. But I was, I don't know about this tongue. You know, I don't, I don't have any too many tongues. Like. And then the way that you did it, like you, the way that you fried it so that it was crispy on the outside, but then like perfectly tender in the middle. And we had these tacos and I think we were having cabbage leaves as like a shell and then just such goodness inside. It was like, oh it stuck with me. Yeah. I was just trying to show off for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, it works. That is the way I love to cook town, so. You got to slow cook it, get it really tender. Um, and when I slow cook it, I'll like put some stuff in there, like maybe some chilies and onions and a few cloves and coriander if I have some growing in the garden and uh, slow cook it. And then you peel it and kind of cut it up and then fry it in like hot, hot lard. 
and it gets mm -hmm. all like that crispy. Because you know, our traditional way with tongue is we just make soup with potato mm -hmm. and celery and a really kind of bare bones broth. And uh, it's good. It's, it's medicine. The elders here love it. I love it. But uh, mm -hmm. the tongue like that, some people have a really hard time with it because it's really fatty. I mean, you just have like a big cube of like fat, fat meat in your mouth. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of got a spongy texture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not for everyone, but yeah. I mean, so that, that style of preparing tongue is like totally inspired by Mexico because mm -hmm. in some regions of Mexico, that's how they do it for tacos, right? They, mm -hmm. they and they'll like squeeze a bunch, a bunch of orange juice on it while they're doing it, while they're like crisping it. And so the orange juice turns into this glaze and it's super, mm. super good. Delicious. Uh, I was like so inspired down in Oaxaca and they just like cooked the most amazing food there. So just taking it in and they make a lot of interesting tacos, like tongue taco, just like head taco, you know, just be like all the different scraps off of a boiled head. And it's so good. Whose head? Like what head? They do a lot of pork, but they'll do like lamb and goat too, and mutton, all kinds of stuff. All right. Um, uh, well, before, I mean, before I forget, can you tell folks a little bit about your work as a caribou guardian? I mean, that's not like an everyday, I don't hear about that job every day. You know, like, what do you do? Oh, I'm a caribou guardian. You know, you obviously do a lot of other things as well, but what, what is a caribou guardian? Yeah. And, okay. and how, and then the second follow-up question, and that's it, is how are the caribou doing right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get that here. I'm not the best multitasker. So. I mean, I can let folks know a little bit that in this photo of you with this caribou, you're not hunting the caribou. You're not harming the caribou. I think when people you know, see this, they're not sure, but you're actually bringing the caribou into a pen, a protected area in your territory uh, where you have the resources to be able to care for this population of caribou that was near extinction because of you know, industrial development and, and logging and so many extractive practices over the years where this uh, twin sister caribou herd population really fought for life. And so your nation and West Overby work together um, to protect and care for this caribou herd and make sure that the female caribou are able to birth in a protected safe area so that those calves have a chance at survival. So, I mean, that's, that's a little bit of what I know, but please feel free to correct or add anything. You got the whole story. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, what I would say is, like, uh, the caribou herd is estimated, so our country is a caribou herd. There's a caribou. caribou. Julian, your sound is your sound is cutting out again a little bit. Arkansas Caesar Range, which is a sacred area. It's our sacred lands of prophecy here on the far end of the lake. So uh, we have a prophecy of when hard times come, you know, and even these could be considered hard times, I guess. But I'm thriving. But uh, when hard times come in the future, we're supposed to go up into that Twin Caesar Range. And the land there, if we look after it, will look after us for, uh, you know, the continue the time immemorial continuum going into the future. Uh, so that area is really significant to us, and that is the area that the caribou. Yeah, there, there's there. We're in the Clint Caesar Range here. That was a couple of weeks ago. I was out for a hike. Um, yeah, so we kind of have this shared uh, attachment to this really beautiful sacred place up in the mountains there in the northern Rockies. And that caribou herd was down to an estimated uh, 12 animals. And so I was down in university at the time when the communities up here recognized the need uh, to do something or else these caribou were going to... Uh, be lost, you know, and because of human activity, really. So they 
went through a big community consultation process and they got some partner, a partner organization and, and they moved forward with the plans of a maternity pen. So uh, basically the concept is we go out and we, we get some, some pregnant cows, pregnant caribou cows in the second week of March, generally shoot for, and, uh, we capture them with helicopters, which is kind of crazy. It's like some mission impossible type action out there. Um, which is, it's, it's fun, but it's, it's stressful for the animals too, you know, but we do it. We monitor everything. Uh, we have vets on site and make sure that they're doing all right. Um, and we bring them into the pen, which is right up in there. You know, it's right up in the Alpine. It's up at 1400 meters. And, uh, it's a 30 acre pen that we built up there and the cows live in there. They calve out in there and they live in there until their calves are big enough that they can easily escape predation from wolves and grizzly bears and black bears. Um, so while they're in there, we feed them some supplemental feed, we try to keep interactions to a minimum. Um, but during the calving season, we keep a close eye on them because there can be challenges in that time. So we work with them and uh, help them out. And, and then we, we have to put a ear tag and a radio collar on those calves because we're monitoring the population closely mm -hmm. to try to get as much knowledge as we can, a comprehensive mm -hmm. understanding of what's happening with them. And so right now it's calving season. So I'll be handling those calves next week. And it's just a treat to be with them. They're such gentle, uh, gentle animals. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but in, in the five, this is maybe the sixth year of the project. I've been there three years now. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the herd is now in the, in the 90s, the population. So it's went from like 12 to like 90 something. Great. And, yeah, so I'll grab something else here, show and tell. These are the exciting stories that I think we need to be hearing at these times, these wins, you know, like, or I think it's been really interesting to see how during this uh, COVID-19 period, there's been a lot of animals that have been coming back into territories that they once occupied, um, that they kind of got run out of, like even just navigating streets because streets are now empty from human activity. Like, I just find that those videos and those stories coming out really humorous and exciting, you know, um, also I think very informative in a lot of ways as well. What's that? So this is uh, a shed antler from one of the cows that's in the pen that mm -hmm. I found on the last shift up there. They are the last ungulate in this territory to drop their antlers, the mm -hmm. cows. They drop them and once they drop them, you know, they're going to have calves soon. So, and then in the pen, we've focused on cows. Like we bring in the cows and we had one young bull in there, just a young one uh, mm -hmm. last year. So this was a new pen that we built when I came on. And when I started, I built the pen uh, with mm -hmm. the group of folks and there was no caribou. So the, the previous pen that they were doing, was in the southern end of their former range and mm -hmm. they started getting in that area. But in the northern end where this pen is, there was no caribou. There hadn't been there in a long time. We hadn't seen mm -hmm. any in our aerial surveys or anything. Um, so, but we've been there two years now. This is the third season and mm -hmm. we let the cows go. And those cows and their babies from the last two years have started repopulating the peaks around the pen in the northern end of their range. And when I was on that hike that you shared the picture of, I found this shed. So I don't know if it's going to see this way. So mm -hmm. here's the one. They're beside mm -hmm. each other. So this here, this shed is a big bull. Yeah. So we released all those cows and their babies. And these big, there's two of them, two big bulls, two big mature bulls. And they migrated across land to come live with the ones we let go. Mm. And I, that was powerful for me. 
the, and flying over and seeing the herds now where they never were in those peaks right around the Twin Sisters, right around Clinsiza, and to see the big herds that are there now, those mm -hmm. big herds, and those big bulls came in. And uh, that was a sign, you know? So it's working. Mm -hmm. It is working. Yeah, and we're not going to have to do what we're doing forever. Right, right. The goal is to not have that herd going forever. But yeah, to not have the pen side of the project. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I got the cooked potatoes in here, and I just added okay. some chopped herbs and a little salt and a little butter. And I'm going to uh, start putting some fish meat in it. So, yeah, this will take a little bit, so we can chat about whatever. But I gotta get these things frying. So slow, Indian time. <laughs> yeah. So you've got the potatoes in there, butter, salt, herbs. How long do you? No, I guess folks pretty much know how to work with potatoes. We've all got potatoes. There's um, there's a different potato here, um, like a native potato. When you're out on the trails and stuff, people will harvest them, and they can be eaten raw and cold and they're they're cut up really like thinly sliced very thinly with lime and salt oh yeah and it's really good it has that you know potato texture but it's just fresh and it's just so earthy and it doesn't have that starchy taste to it like other potatoes it has like a very light and then of course with lime and salt and so yeah. i've had some potatoes while you're just waiting for you know, whatever's cooking on the fire to cook. It's a great way to, you know, kind of pique your appetite. Yeah. Really delicious. Is, is it a jicama? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Let me look. Let me look for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so many cool foods all over. They had really cool yams in uh, Guatemala, camote, different pink ones and purple ones. It would be like real little different shapes. Oh yeah, the other thing that you had asked about was podcasting, I think. And uh, I've also had this intention to podcast. I consume a lot of podcasts. And I just love the storytelling approach, the oral narrative. And I just haven't found, like, there's not too much focusing on Indigenous health. I think there's a lot of room in that space. Um, and there's a lot of people working in that realm, but there's not too much content available. Um, so I would really like to, I don't know, at times I feel like challenged by the fact that I'm just like, you know, able-bodied, light-skinned, cis dude. And like maybe my voice isn't what's needed in the world. But the cool thing about a po podcast is it could be a platform to support other folks to share too, right? And when mm -hmm. I think about it, I think about all the people who I would love to just have conversations with so they can share their stories more. And uh, mm -hmm. But I just, again, I've had a hard time finding the capacity with everything I'm trying to balance. And I guess I just haven't prioritized it enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I recently had some folks that I'm like a big fan of reach out to me and be like, oh, we're you know trying to get something off the ground here. And we're hoping that you would want to be involved with us in building this. So mm -hmm. now I have this collective and uh folks and it's just like we just had the first conversation yesterday yeah um basically we're gonna work on material that is sharing stories from the bipoc community so black mm -hmm. indigenous people of color mm -hmm. uh, that are in the realm of hunting fishing and farming mm -hmm. yeah and so the fellow who reached out to me, he's down in the Bay Area. And like, I'm just like a big fan of him and his work. And uh, 
you know so i don't want to say too much about it because we're just starting but things mm -hmm. are developing on that front and mm -hmm. uh, someone else that a lot of you will be aware of from up here in bc another cool young indigenous food warrior mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there's some stuff in the works there, and I kind of feel like, oh, that's maybe what I need is this collective to carry mm -hmm. the burden, the workload. Mm -hmm. Content creation is a ton of work. Like I've done it in the past, but that was when that was my job. You know, my only job was content creation, and I was with Redwire. And uh, shout out to Redwire. Shout out to the Redwire OGs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I. Some people have asked me before, like I've had a couple different projects, like, you know, let me try and do a podcast. Let me try and do a Facebook interview series. And just on that note, one of my bits of advice, whether or not it's good advice, is to just do it. It's to just yeah. try it, you know, even just to play around. Like I think obviously there needs to be a lot of thought in terms of strategy and like intention and everything. But at the same time, I do think it's important that we don't get super intimidated if we don't have all the skills at the time and that we just try, you know, especially when it comes to elevating indigenous voices, you know, and especially when it comes to these times, like that's why I kind of got going on this Facebook series is because it's really important that we're having these good conversations and that we're having them together. You know, and that we can be we can meet in your, you know, in your cousin's kitchen right now. Right, that you can show us a little bit of what you're involved in, and we can just have a good conversation. So, I would recommend too for anyone who's curious about podcasting or you know, Facebook series or whatever, just to just to try it, just to give it a shot, and not be. It doesn't have to be perfect either, you know. It doesn't need to be the most like stylish, well curated production piece. Although that's great too. It's also cool to just you know do what you can with what you have where you are. Heck yeah. I like, it. I like the kind of, I appreciate when people are just like rough and real, you know, like they don't all have to be polished. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, so what are you doing now? So you're deboning? Yeah. So this is the, the most labor intensive part of doing it like this is I'm just working out these little bones and Mm -hmm. The soccer fish has a lot of them, but I'm just about done two fish now. Mm -hmm. You know, the byproduct was that I got a big pot of like the most healing broth there. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's enough. And I'm going to mash this up. I'm actually going to start heating up some moose lard right now to fry these in. What do you coat them in? Coat? Or do you, yeah, like, do you, so once you mash up the fish, do you put, do you coat them in anything before putting them on the lard or do you just? I'm not going to today. So, I mean, um, sometimes I would use, like if, when I'm eating everything, uh, my friends at Wildwood Farm here, at local, beautiful local farm where everything's organic and farmed with horses. Uh, they grow grain, they grow spelt and rye and uh, like red fife wheat and all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, so they give me some of their beautiful flour and that would work really good. Or, uh, you know, some other thing to use would be cattail pollen, which is a cool flour substitute um, and is a lot less work than the cattail roots, which also you can make a flour substitute. And here, historically, we used to eat a lot of cattail. And I was going to go pick some, but I kind of flaked out and didn't walk all the way down to the swamp. <laughs> but yeah, cattail, cattail flour is a thing. Hmm? So that would work really good. Um, yeah, but today I'm not going to coat them with anything. They're going to be just fine like this. Mm -hmm. so, and they're already infused with all of that good flavor while they were cooking there. Yeah. And then I like chopped up a bunch more fresh herbs and put them in there too. And a little bit of nettle. Uh huh. Like a bit of butter. Um, so that's 
should be really good. The one other thing I wanted to add was some some more seaweed. So mm -hmm. uh, I like cut my finger really bad the other day. Ouch. Yeah, it's it's kind of gilt, but if I like hit it on stuff, it's a little tender. So <laughs> I'm gonna grind some of this seaweed in the vitamins and just put like seaweed flakes in here. Yum. Yeah. I'm just trying to eat eat the seaweed. This stuff's like two years old now. I totally just found it. I forgot about it. So mm -hmm. it don't do that at home. Don't forget about your seaweed. Yeah. What are some of the health properties of seaweed? So there we go. It's just like pulverized now. It's like fish food. Yeah. <laughs> Julian, good. what are the biggest health properties of seaweed other than being high in iron? Oh, well, that's kind of the thing is it's not just iron, but it has like a whole bunch of the trace minerals, mm. which, um, you know, can be hard to get. Like the main place we get the trace minerals is from really good salt, mm -hmm. but not everyone has access to really good salt. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, but then I think like, and I don't see, I don't know everything. I don't, but I think that seaweed might actually have like, like protein in it, mm. but I don't know. It's delicious. I like it because it tastes good. <laughs> it does taste good. So, I got this going. The only thing this is going to need now is a few eggs. And I'm going to okay. whisk them up first, just because those potatoes are kind of hot and I want the egg to like be raw when it gets in there. <coughs> so again, these are like beautiful eggs from Fourth Sister Farm. And uh, who knows, we had our first meeting and we've been talking about some projects too. Mm -hmm. so, keep your eye on Fourth Sister Farm. Yeah, I just had a whole bunch of people reach out to me in the past two weeks <laughs> about collaborating on initiatives, you know? And I'm like, it's funny because last year I worked really hard and I kind of unintentionally isolated myself. <laughs> and I came out of that kind of feeling burnt out and depressed and being like, yeah. I'm to really prioritize nurturing relationships with uh, mm -hmm. people in life. Mm -hmm. and, and so I had set this intention. I was like, yeah, 2020, I'm going to just go visit people all the time. Like, I don't have to work all the time. I'm going to go. I'm going to go visit my friends in Haida Gwaii. I'm going to go visit my friends down south, you know, go visit my friends in the Yukon. And, uh, and then this COVID stuff happened, and it's like, I'm actually not going to go visit anybody. <laughs> you know, in the one year, and that was the main intention I set for the year, was visiting. Uh, so. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, like, we have to laugh at the plans that we make and we think are going to happen, right? Like, Yeah. I think so. there were a lot of plans that were changed. Okay, so wait, you're mashing up what exactly? So that's everything. It's everything. Everything. It's sucker fish, meat, debone. It's the hide of potatoes. It's the, uh, the eggs, minced nettle, minced chive, and minced tarragon from the garden with a little bit of butter. And uh, yeah, it's looking pretty perfect. I had about maybe like six cups, five or six cups of potato to like like two cups of fish because mm -hmm. otherwise it'd be like too wet. You mm -hmm. need that potato to, so it's looking like six, a to six hide of potatoes to two. Well, like six cups of cooked potato mm -hmm. to like two cups of fish meat. Six yeah. cups of cooked potatoes. Okay. That's forming a nice patty. It's got some, it's working. 
Do you have a sucker fish song that you sing when you're cooking? Oh, okay. I actually, it's a family rule here. I'm not allowed to sing. Okay, because it's not good, hey? <laughs> I mean, I sing our sweat songs. I sing the sweat songs from my dad's sweat practice. Like when I was a kid, he lived here with me and he was sun dancing then and mm -hmm. was doing that half. And so I learned those songs. But those mm -hmm. are kind of songs for ceremony. And yeah. Know them, but I'm just like not a good singer. <laughs> we can't do everything, Julian, as you're making a gourmet meal with all of the ingredients harvested from your territories or through your trade relationships, I think we can forgive you for not singing as well. Yeah. So I went heavy on the lard, like three okay. tablespoons in there. In fact, I'm going to add one more just because it's like the cleanest, most beautiful, purest. Like, look at that moose lard. It's like pure white. Wow. So that was like first pull. When you're making lard, like, you get like your first pull and that's the purest, cleanest stuff. And then you keep it going a bit and your second pull will be like getting a little bit of brown in it. So that's one of your episodes is teaching people how to make lard. <laughs> yeah. Five, lard, five ways to make lard. Mm -hmm. yeah. This stuff I made when I was living in the wall tent outside. Mm -hmm. I was just doing all outdoor cooking last year which was really fun. And I had a crew of youth here from the community helping me on my house. And we basically would just like hang out like all summer long in the evenings and just like cook different traditional foods and eat together and visit. And that was just an awesome, awesome time. Um, so I guess it wasn't that isolated. I did have my res rat crew. They were like, <laughs> always working on my house. It was like the youngest one was 12 and the oldest one was 21. Yeah, we talked about we talked about having young friends and how that's okay. Uh, oh, and you yeah. were also surrounded by caribou. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, Teachers and patients, patients. I like that. Yeah. So I'm gonna get one batch of these going. Okay. So you're just gonna fry them in the lard for how long on either side? So I'm just going to go with the vibe. Like everything's already cooked. Mm -hmm. So the idea with the frying is just to get it that nice crispy brown color on the outside. Mm. Actually, that lard is not quite hot enough yet. When you're cooking with lard, like any fat, you want to make sure it's like nice and hot before you put something like this in there. Because mm -hmm. if it's not hot, then the potato will just like absorb so much fat. That'll mm. be really, really grease. So, really greasy. Yeah. Yeah. Grease. So uh, I'm just gonna make sure that's like cracking hot. So like right when you put it in, it's like. Tss. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the last thing is these greens. Here. And these greens, I am uh, not gonna wash or anything because I know they're clean. I mean, that elk could have pissed on them, maybe, but. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. They're, they're clean, everybody. They're good. <laughs> I feel like these COVID times, there's at least where I am, there's like a hyper paranoia about bacteria, right? Which obviously there's a global health pandemic, but let's okay, see. So <laughs> Your greens are clean. One of my farmer friends, like I was visiting and she was They'll remain anonymous just because it's kind of embarrassing, but like she's been having some stomach issues, like gastro distress. Yeah. So she did like this stool sample, like the three day stool sample test, which is something I've wanted to do. Like, I'm just like curious, like what's going on? Do I have parasites? Do I have, you know, like what? I want to know. <laughs> I guess that's my science side, but, uh, she works around lots of animals and so you just get poopy like milking cows and stuff and raising pigs and you get poopy and um her test came back saying she has giardia which is like beaver fever which you get from like drinking water with feces in it you know mm, 
I have yeah. an ex who got Giardia one time and I saw it's a long process. It's hard to fight, right? It's yeah. a lot. It takes a lot out of you. Like, you know, people lose a lot of weight, a lot of, yeah, they're eating all, all the things inside you, the good and the bad. So it's, it's tricky. That's a battle. Is she going to try, is she going to go on antibiotics to try and get at it naturally or? Yeah. I think she's going to probably do a course of, like I have heard of people treating it herbally, but I think mm -hmm. she's going to, I don't know, actually, you know what? I shouldn't say, she didn't tell me. Right. She just figured it out. Like she just got the news. So she's got to navigate that. Mm. Yeah. But. Our, yeah, we're so susceptible to all. I was just down the street the other day and someone was talking about a family member having dengue. You know, oh, like yeah. there's just, just all kinds of things going on these days, right? And I think our food, what we put in our body is so essential. You know, it's so essential. And often, I mean, even when we talk about addictions, for example, we don't always think even about food addictions. We don't think about emotional eating habits, um, you know, and I think we talk about a lot of systems that have problems, but the food system often gets underlooked. I think it's so important to constantly be talking about foods and production of food and harvesting and relationship to foods. And um, so, I mean, I hope it's a conversation we continue to have and I'll be continuing to follow your work and keeping an eye out for any kind of podcast or book or whatever that may be collective that you're going to be sharing because I mean, you are, carry a lot of knowledge about hunting and harvesting and cooking even like, you know, it's one thing to be, to know how to hunt and know how to harvest and follow your own protocols and laws and that and your own family traditions. But it's another thing to know how to cook, you know, and to kind of weave in knowledge from other territories as well. Like your knowledge about salts from the South and, and where herbs have traveled. And I think that's, we appreciate that you're joining us today is what I'm trying to say. Oh yeah, it's an honor to be on here. It's fun. I've been having yeah. fun. Yeah. So you're talking about um well you're talking about hunting and before that you mentioned like this kind of germophobia or whatever. Mm -hmm. going on with COVID, which like I do not really like to use like hand sanitizer. But <laughs> Thinking about hunting. Don't tell like, people that. They're going to get very angry with you. You should be wearing your mask oh, right yeah. now. I know. Well, I, I mean, whatever. I had, I found some like organic hand sanitizer spray, so I'm using it. Hmm. I don't know. But yeah, you were talking about hunting, and like, I was just like thinking about, like, I, well, I started writing a piece. I've been just kind of writing some content with the intention of it maybe being for a blog or whatever, but I was writing a piece about the benefits of hunting from an hmm. indigenous lens. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things, there's so many things. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I could go on all day. But, go on all day. <laughs> but one of the things that is like, I'm theorizing about, you know, and I don't know, like, I haven't seen any research again, but it's like when you get in there and you're out in the bush, and you're in the dirt, and you open up an animal, and you got all that, all that internal, that healthy bacteria from a healthy animal out on the land that's been eating its proper foods, you know, and is had minimal contact to the industrial world, this human, this human world. Um, and you get in there and you're working with it. It takes a long time when you're doing a buffalo or a moose. You're right up in its guts and like pulling out the liver and the kidneys. And, you know, we like to eat the chuxis, the lower intestine, which is like full of feces. And mm. you clean it out and kind of, I feel like that combination of you and the earth and that animal, like I think that there's some kind of bacterial interaction there that is a great benefit to us as humans. Like we're getting mm -hmm. this nature, like never mind a fecal transplant or whatever people are doing. Like I don't want to do that, but like I'll get my my like 
probiotic boost from in there and like working with all the innards of animals. Right. <laughs> Julian, yeah. what I mean, what do you think about this ongoing um, misunderstanding? I feel like that a lot of people who don't also don't agree with the uh, the way that animals are farmed and produced, like um, people who are vegan, for example, who don't want to support the mass industrialization of like food farming and all of the problems that come with that, the environmental impact, the health impact, the ethical questions. Um, what What is your conversation around the difference between, you know, those kinds of people and then, and then food sovereignists, people who still want to practice their hunting and harvesting ways of yeah. life? Yeah. Well, first of all, to quote my dear friend and mentor, Don Morrison, our indigenous food systems are the most sustainable food systems on the planet. They always have been. Uh, and our time in memorial history stands testament to that. So, but, uh, you know, the reality is, like with the amount of humans now, like I don't want everyone coming hunting on my territory. There's a lot of people. So we got to be realistic about what's happening. And yeah, like my my kind of Daneza and Cree mixed ancestral food system or biocultural heritage of this region, it's for us, you know? It's for us, it's our food system. It's not for everybody, it's not for the whole world. Um, and if people wanna come here and go through the right process of building a relationship and learning the protocols, then they could be there for them too, but they have to do it in a good way. Um, you know, but I would say that the, the industrial farming system uh, is just as harmful, whether it's vegetables uh, or fruit or meat. So for someone to say, I'm not eating meat um, because of its harmful environmental impacts, then I sure hope that they're, you know, getting all their vegetables from uh, local farmers that are growing mm -hmm. organically and uh, are farming mm -hmm. in the right way that they know and trust because the, uh, the industrial production of grains and vegetable crops is, is every bit as harmful as the uh, production of, of industrial meat. Mm -hmm. so it's just this 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 giant kind of corporate level production, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Like, the, the, the growing of GMO crops and the associated use of of glyphosate and Roundup is like the most harmful thing happening on the planet today. And yeah, that goes into. Uh, a lot of that goes into animal feed, right? So that's a problem. Um, but then I know people that are raising animals and they're not giving them any feed. Those mm -hmm. animals are, are just forging off the land and they're increasing the biodiversity. And the pasture management systems that they're using are actually sequestering more uh, carbon than the methane that those cows are releasing. You know, because that's the other thing. It's like, oh, these cows are, this livestock's releasing all this methane. And yeah, it's true. And, you know, but it's nowhere near the amount of, of greenhouse gases that are being released by the transportation of a global food system. So, you mm -hmm. know, the impact of eating non-seasonal, non-local foods is worse for the planet than, than eating beef. A lot worse. So, Peace. you know, it's like, it's like, look at it from a holistic perspective and, and I totally respect people's decisions for people's personal decisions. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I guess I just hope that folks are, are kind of taking the time to really think it all through and, 
you know, if you want to be a responsible steward in, in, in the way you carry yourself, then yeah, ultimately out of season, non-organic vegetables and grains aren't going to save the planet. Right. Thank you for that. So what's happened now? What are you doing now? Give us the latest update. And can we see any of these fish patties or any of them? Okay. So I'm raising these greens. And okay. uh, I'm just going to, like I put a bit of lard in there, but now I'm going to put it just a bit of the fish broth in there. To cook them with. Um, okay, so you have lard, some fish broth, you're braising the greens. Yeah. And these greens are a side accompaniment to the dish? Yeah. And these, um, oh yeah, these fish cakes are going off. Oh my goodness. Looks so good. Yeah, so. Shout out to your cousin for her new home. It's looking fabulous. Oh yeah, this is now called Snob Hill on the rest. People are like, oh yeah, Snob Hill. I already put a link to Bougie Native. Check wow. it out. Super browned up and crispy. We'll just crisp up that other side. The greens are almost ready. They don't take long at all. So I just gotta, oh, I forgot about this row. These cook really fast too. <laughs> Wow. If anyone is watching or stayed or will check in, this is like, I don't know if this is making other people hungry, but this is, I'm like, all I'm thinking about right now is like, what am I going to cook after this? <laughs> like, I need to eat. So I've got a little more lard and I'll put the, the sucker roll in there. Okay. And then the last thing is this little sauce. We're going to get saucy. Mm. Your tartar sauce, chopped up dill pickles. Yeah, it's super simple. So the base is this bougie cream based kefir. Based kefir. So it's like quite thick. Like it's like thick as yogurt. It's like a yogurt, hey? Yeah, but it's it's got a bit more kind of funk. It's got that kefir funk that a lot of people hate. So <laughs> if you don't like it, you could easily substitute some yogurt in this. Right. And, uh, and I mean, there are so many other kinds of sauces too you could make too, right? Like if you don't, if people aren't fans of a tartar sauce or a tartar like sauce, there's a lot of other, like I'm sure you could do a nice lemon parsley or something. Oh yeah. But check these pickles. So wild fermented in my wall tent, Whatever yeast propagated them was just like the wild stuff in my tent. Okay. <laughs> and stored in the root cellar all winter. And now the next year they're like crisp. They're like super crispy. Uh, so good. I want to go. <laughs> I think that's just like kind of magic the way that works. I got a little bit of dill in there and garlic that are from the pickle jar. And I'm just gonna add it all for there. We have a comment. Bernice says, I'm getting hungry. I hope to go up to the farm where Dawn is working to have the dish she made last night and have some other yummy foods. That's great. That would be what awesome. did she make today? What did she make, Bernice? What did she, does anyone know what Dawn made last night? Um, I know she's talking about the, yeah, she's talking about the food farm in Sequetmic territory, right? And Dawn's right now with her parents and Chase and their, you know, the food farm crew is getting together in a socially responsible and socially distant way. And um, yeah, Bernie says her mouth is watering. Me too. Like my I'm feeling hungry. The other thing I love about food and we didn't even talk about it is like, this is cross cultural too. Food just brings people together. You know, food is just has such an ancient history of like, bringing people together. There's so much more to it than even just the ingredients and the things that we've been talking to. So there are a lot of conversations for us to continue to have in the future. Um, I think Don, I think Don made a, um, a chicken dish. So nice. nice. She'll enjoy uh, that. Hey, hi, Bernice. I miss you. Hope you're good. <laughs> so glad you're on here. It's an honor to have you here with us. Yeah. 
So when I first got to know Dawn, she was running uh, a program that was bringing folks from primarily from the downtown east side, but bringing indigenous folks from Vancouver out to the UBC farm where they were growing beautiful indigenous foods and getting salmon and cooking meals together. So they'd go out and work in the garden and then cook like beautiful meals and just eat together. And, mm. uh, you know, Bernice was always there. And that was just like, I came in at a time when I was super isolated from my community back home and I wasn't getting any of that good food and, you know, kind of yearning for that connection to land and to be with other indigenous people. And that was just such a place of medicine. So mm. beautiful the way that they conducted that there. And, and uh, so I have really fond memories of that time. And when I kind of started coming back home and hunting, I would bring them moose meat and stuff and just get involved there. So that's cool. Bernice is on there. Yeah, they've just responded saying, I miss you too. It's an honor for me to see you and watch you and listen to you talk about our traditional ways and food preparation. Uh, it's an honor. It's an honor for me too, Julian. I think it's an honor for all of us that you've taken the time and you know, I've mentioned to people before, it's not always so easy to to get you where you actually have service. You know, yeah. like you're not you spend so much time in the bush and so much time at that caribou pen. You're not often online, so we're all very grateful that you've taken this time to share with us. Yeah, yeah, sweet, mutual, mutual, reciprocal. So the last thing I'm going to add here is just a, an extra chunk of this beautiful, beautiful butter into those braised greens. So the concept of braising, you use a broth and you kind of add just enough so that by the time the broth evaporates, the greens are cooked. And it's like a nice, healthy way to cook greens. Mm -hmm. and just put that, the broth evaporated. Whoa, these sucker eggs are, they get a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. What's happening to them? Why do they get crazy? What do you mean? Well, they start popping, like, and they shoot out. And they're just like hot, hot little bombs. <laughs> put a lid on there. Bernice yeah. wants to trade for some caribou meat. Do you eat caribou after working so closely with caribou? Do you still? Oh, so I want to eat caribou. We're not hunting this herd right now. We will again in the future. Um, you know, I hope that if I ever have kids one day, I would hope that they would have that opportunity and maybe I could bear witness to that. Um, but for me to go get a caribou, I got to head north. I got to head north up into... Uh, I'd check in with the folks at Prophet River and ask them if it'd be okay if I went out and, and went out after caribou up there because uh, mm -hmm. they still have pretty good herds north of here. Mm -hmm. So I might do that. Uh, I would really like to. Um, it would kind of be like a like a spirit hunt for me to go, mm -hmm. out and, you know, after all this work. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, I would hunt one. I want to have them more now that I work with them so closely. I want to <laughs> Yeah, hunting is a form of honoring. And there was something that, it might have been gone. Oh yeah, these are going. That's yeah, pork and really caribou, Bernice is saying. It might have been gone or someone that told me this concept that, or maybe we just discussed it. But the concept that by honoring our sacred relationship with our foods, we increase their abundance. Mm. And we forget, when we forget to carry out our role in those relationships, everything suffers. Mm -hmm. Whether that's going out and netting salmon in your territory, or going out and hunting moose in your territory, or raising the corn in your territory, mm -hmm. where it is, we need to uphold that relationship. It's our responsibility. And in doing so, all the participants in that work thrive. So I think that's just a really beautiful way of looking at it. And I feel that, you know, mm -hmm. we've had years where the moose are really down here. The moose 
there's not as much moose as there was when I was a kid. Um, and we've responded to that. We've augmented our, our hunting practices, but we still do it. And I don't think that our community, the small amount of the total harvest that our community does is the problem. Hmm. Part of the solution. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, you know, the, the problems are, there's many, but it's not us going out and, you know, doing that work with prayers and doing that work with tobacco and doing it from a sacred place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So I would love okay, to. Okay, we're going to have to round up. And I know that you're coming I to an end. So. Yay. Right now. So I'm going to plate it and we're going to call it. We got to do the plate though. All right, let's plate it. You're going to have to take a fancy photo. Bring it nice and close. So this I will. Like yeah, I'll do it right over here. So there, yeah, we got a bit of a visual. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to start with the bed of with the bed of the braised greens finished in that beautiful butter. So there's five mm -hmm. types of wild greens in there. Just harvested this morning. No, a little bit of extra of that butter with the fish broth in there. And then I'll put a just fried crispy fish cake on there. Sucker fish cake with hide a potato. Ooh, Ooh. Did you see how much that exploded? These crazy eggs that are worth it, worth the trouble. Just a little bit. Because they're really rich. Something like that. And then just this sauce doesn't look too appealing, unfortunately, but we're gonna work with it. A little bit of that on there. Very soft. There it is. Yay! I'm so. That looks so good. So oh, it's man. super healthy. Nothing bad in there. Wow! <laughs> I'm so hungry and ready to eat something delicious. Look at how beautiful that is. Look at those fish eggs. Yeah, mm. they're the best. Yeah. So. There it is. Um, thank you Julie, all. Julie, you have a comment, a comment from Rustin who says, Miigwech, Yako, to you too for sharing us how to cook them and mush them, those bush-based foods. <laughs> I know what I'm, he said, I know what I'm cooking this weekend. Awesome. Thanks for being here. I hope to meet you in person. Totally. Well, Julian, thank you so much for your time. I mean, I hope we can do this again. Maybe we can have like a regular spot on this Facebook series show. <laughs> cooking cooking class with Julian. I'm going to have to figure out a way that I could be cooking and eating at the same time because this is just, this is a really good lesson in patience and discipline. Some of our natural laws. Observation, yeah. patience, and discipline. Um, are there, is there anything else that you'd like to share in this time? Any closing thoughts? Mm, I guess, uh, yeah, I'd just say, like, like wherever you are, take the time, put in the work, connect with your local food system, connect with your local farmers, get to know the plants that are growing around you and the incredible abundance of food and medicine that they offer you, mm -hmm. and uh, just build and nurture those relationships. We all need to do it. The earth needs it, and we need it, too. And just sending lots of love to everyone. Hi, hi. Ojo asinala, masicho. You have a, a question. You've got lots of thanks here. You know, Tiffany saying thanks. Bernice, Sid, who, you know, thanks for being here, Sid, and being consistently a part of these shows. And then a question, when are you on again? So if that question's for me, I will be having interviews every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday around the same time. So I'll let I'll let folks know what's coming up next week. Next week we're going to be hearing from some awesome Indigenous community leaders 
a little bit about their journeys, entrepreneurs, people involved in different kinds of activities, but just what it's taken for them to to really, you know, be become a community leader and go back home and do that good work. Um, and then if you're talking about Julian, I would love to have Julian back on here anytime. Cooking, whatever. It doesn't have to be cooking. We could just be chatting as well. But we as a community really value you and your knowledge and your voice. And even when you are feeling isolated, just like me and others, we're, we're not alone. We're together in this. And all of these good thoughts and words that you've shared today makes us feel even more together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Big love to everybody. Yeah, take care. We gotta care. move my body a little bit. We gotta move our bodies and get get outside. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> it's the yeah. dance party now. Enjoy yeah. your meal. Should, can we see you take a bite? Like, can you take a bite and let us know? Like, there's gotta be some eating aspect to this right now. Oh my god. It's pretty good. <laughs> It's so good. Oh my goodness. Thank you to your homelands and to this fish, the sucker fish for its life and to everyone who's been stewarding and caring for your lands and everybody who's doing that good work. Thank you so much for all of that good work and let's keep going. All right, ciao. Yeah. See Bye, you again everybody. soon.